Lord, we are so honored to call you our king this morning. Lord, we know that you're not the king of a lot of these worldly things and what is happening in this world. But thou art the king of saints. And Lord, much like it was in the days of David, when there was a band of rejects following David before he came to his throne, Lord, we know you're going to take the throne of this world. Lord, you're going to rule. Set up your own kingdom. And Lord, I, I'm so glad that, Lord, I can already call you my king this morning. That your word is king. Your life is king. And Lord, we invite you to bring your kingdom and set it up in our heart, Lord. We want to follow you. We want to obey you. We want to give our life to you. And Lord, we're asking you, now come in your kingdom. Lord, allow us to sit with you. Lord, just so we can be close. Father, we ask you this morning, may you anoint this service. May you help us, Lord. May you be our strength this morning. May you be our mercy and our grace and our heart, Lord. We're Asking you this morning that you had walked the aisles of this meeting. And Lord, your children gathered here. Lord, they drove and sacrificed their time and money and brought their families. And have gathered around, Lord, not just to hear a, a man speak, but Lord, to worship you who is king. And Lord, to give you honor and praise and glory. And 
And Lord, with our invitation of worship and our invitation to speak of you, Lord, your prophet said you'd come with your invited. Lord, your prophet said it, Lord. He said that you would come, Lord, that if we would invite you. And Lord, as a congregation right now, we openly invite you to come, Lord. Kick open every door of our lives, Lord. Kick open every situation in the church, Lord. And Father, may you, may you be the great healer in this meeting, Lord. The needs of your people, oh God. For those that are in the hospitals this morning, Lord, we, we are not even allowed to go in and pray with them. But Father, I pray this morning, God, that you would reach beyond the barriers of that hospital room and may you touch our brethren, oh God. May your mercy touch upon them, oh God of all gods. The King of heaven, we invite you. Would you move on the scene this morning, Lord? Father, as we stand here today, now, Lord, we're asking you, you'd move in this congregation. You'd take our words and you'd use them, Lord, for thy glory and thine honor. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. And God bless you this morning. Amen. It's sure good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. What a blessing. Amen. To be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I uh, want to greet each of you. If you'd open your Bibles this morning to the book of Daniel, the fifth chapter, uh, we're going to be going over here to uh, the 25th verse. Uh, we'll be right, uh, reading Daniel 5 and verse 25. I do want to say uh, I, 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 appreciate, uh, I appreciate our medical people here in the church. And if there ever was a time people are hurting and sick and needing help, it, it's now. And uh, we were having breakfast with Zach and Ben the other morning. And I was just thinking that Brother Ray and I can't get in to pray for some of the sick. But God's blessed us with these, these young men. And they're, they're going in daily and visiting with uh, Brother Darren, Brother Robert. They're praying with them. And, and I just say God bless them. And we sure thank the Lord for them. Amen. Uh, we just want to. Do that. Daniel 5 and verse 25. If you could pull that up, thank you. Uh, and this is the writing that was written. Meaning, many tickle you, Farson. This is the writing that was written. God bless you as you may be seated this morning. Uh, I have just read something to you uh, that was supernaturally written on the party halls of the palace of Babylon when it was coming to an end. I want to this morning to speak to you a little bit from Daniel, the fifth chapter, and I, uh, if the subject would be the handwriting on the wall. Uh, we have several places that we can pull from this morning uh, because, of the, uh, because of the message of the hour uh, we have an absolute authority on this subject and able to look deeper into it than just the surface. And uh, we want to, if we can, just maybe to take a few minutes in the setting. You that was here on Thursday night, we talked a lot about uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his time in the field and the lessons that was learned was learned was of humility. And uh, in Daniel, the fifth chapter, this is a time of the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the rule has left, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son had actually ruled for a period of time, but he had brought on his grandson, Belshazzar, who was uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. They were actually ruling here together. There actually was, I believe there was two, two leaders at this moment. And, uh, but yet the, the grandson had moved up a little closer, in, and it was actually become the king of uh, Babylon here in the book of Daniel the fifth chapter you'll read a couple different places it'll call this boy the son of Nebuchadnezzar but it was his grandson uh, and so but as you as you read here the setting of this uh, scene a prophet will take us back here and he'll talk to us a little bit about the city of Babylon now we've been studying the book of Daniel and we've been talking a lot about Babylon so I'll not go deep into that area of it but 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 we do know that Babylon uh, was a city that was built, of course, uh, in that time. It was a great scientific city. 
it was the leading city of the world. Many things we have today actually come from Babylon. It's even today, uh, like your 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute and 24 hours, all that came from Babylon. There's uh, several, even the hieroglyphics, some of the arithmetic. A lot of them things actually come from those time periods. So they're very advanced people. And uh, this, this city of Babylon that, uh, that we're reading about this morning had is come to its glory. It's come to its heights. It's uh, been a city so long that it has become secure within itself and within the borders of its walls. It had a, a tremendous army, great army. Brother Bram said it had, uh, of course, I think he was referring to America when he said it, but he's talking about they had the greatest of armies, even of atomic warfare. And he was talking about the power of the army in that time. And he said not only did they have a tremendous army, and had done, had done amazing feats as far as being conquerors, they had also at the same time built walls around the city of Babylon. Uh, Brother Bram says it here, he says it's amazing that they was some near 200 feet high and 80 foot thick. Uh, the city circular was about 120 miles, so they had 120 miles of 200 foot high walls that were 80 foot thick. He said they could run chariot races on the top of those walls. They did have the gates in the city, but the gates were actually brass. So they wasn't wooden gates, which was a great protection from fire whenever uh, an army would attack. Of course, the way they would attack was they would attack the gates, and if there were wooden gates, they'd just shoot them full of uh, fire and burn the gates and break through, and they, they'd go on. So these guys had stone walls, and they had brass gates, and they were thick enough uh, that they couldn't get through it, high enough they couldn't climb over it. And Brother Bram said because they had gotten behind these walls, he said they had began to get a great security and to believe that they were untouchable. And Brother Bram says any time man gets in the place where he builds security like this, he said this is the point that sin begins to take over. When men believe that God can't see them or that there would be no re recompense or no payment for the things that done, he said that's when sin really begins to ramp up. Uh, it normally does not produce a, a, a better place to live. It produces a better place to sin. And so whenever that they started doing this, this, this is a point that Brother Bram is very strong on. And by making this point, he brings it up in handwriting on the wall. And he did something back in the Matthew series, if any of you remember back that far when we were dealing with Matthew 2. Uh, we, we actually went into how that the Bible said, and God had brought uh, his son out of Israel. And use that specific scripture to prove that God uses the scripture more than one time. So sometimes we see people read a scripture and they think, well, that's the end of that scripture. Whatever one time it was in the Old Testament or something. But Brother Branham uh, actually uh, brings the Bible to us and says that the Bible is not just like a letter that you wrote one of your friends. He said, like, if I write you a letter, it's good one time to that one person. He said, but the, the, the Bible is the inspired word of God. He said, so it's so powerful. He says that its meanings and its scripture are manifold. In other words, it, it will be used again and again because of the meaning. In the case of Matthew 2, I bring thy son out of Egypt. He said that was Jacob when Jacob come out of Egypt, when Israel come out of Egypt. But again, it lived again when Jesus was brought out of Egypt in his day. Same scripture, amen, but it was used the same way. Of course, again, uh, we know the scripture says that uh, the talk, Jesus one day said, you seek a sign, but no sign given to a wicked and adulterous generation except the sign of Jonas. Of course, that's a double scripture. It's in the days of Jesus, but Brother Bram said he was speaking that day, but really was meaning it for this day. So when we look back in the scripture and we're reading Daniel chapter 5, Brother Bram uses Daniel 5 exactly the same way. And he said, actually, see that the scripture is today repeating again like it did in the days of Babylon. So when you're reading Daniel 5, you think you're reading about Belshazzar's feast. You're thinking you're reading about something that happened in 539 B.C. You're thinking it's that far removed from you, over 2,500 years. But actually, you're reading 
reading uh, today's newspaper. You can take the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and you can realize it's actually happening right now today because scriptures are repeating itself. Now, what Brother Branham is showing us is we do not have Belshazzar, we do not have Babylon, but we have America and we have the same spirit that was existing in the days of Babylon is existing today the same way. Now, Brother Branham is very clear to say that spirits don't die. He said men die, but the spirits live on. So we see that the, as the repeat of Scripture begins, then you can go back in the Scripture, and Brother Bam does a tremendous job to do this, of showing the similarities between Babylon and the current day. And he actually makes the Scriptures begin to live quite, quite profoundly. He preaches it several times. It's entitled Handwriting on the Wall. I would suggest anyone could, could, would go listen to it and look. Because even Brother Branham draws out points like certain, like uh, they had 200-foot roads. Now, that, that's an odd thing uh, to say about a city having 200-foot roads typing it. But how many realize that America didn't have super highways until just the last 50 years? It was a, you go through a lot of little towns and you, you, you look and see how the little bitty streets was in the towns. I've been to Europe several times. Euro, European streets in Germany sometimes on those little streets, you can't hardly even put one car. And they park on the because it was in the times when America was born. Of course, it was it was a, a horse and buggies, and it was small cars. And then the roads come along, and it was just little. I don't know if you've ever seen the cars and, uh, from the early '40s, but they're just little narrow cars. And so the the, the the highways were very small in this country. But after World War II, remember they seen the autobahn that was in Germany, and they come back, and Eisenhower began to build the interstate systems, and he was doing it for military use to be able to. Uh, uh, to bring the military across, and they started building interstates and super highways. Well, you, you think those things just happened, but Brother Branham had a vision in 1933 where there would be a, an auto car, an automated car driving down a super highway. And he explains these real super wide highways, but they didn't have them in 1933. But today, look at the super highways we have. And he talks about Babylon in the days of its destruction, having 200 foot highways. So he's showing us that whatever was existing during those days have now begun to relive again. And not just the highways being wide, not just the militaries being great, but we're living in a time when the attitude of the people have returned to the same attitude that it was in that day see in, in this country now I know many of us is too young to remember these things but we do have history and we do have books and you can read and look and, uh, but in the, in the 40's in America people were desperate for God not just the message people not just a few people uh, that were in a certain type of church but, but you had community churches and you had where people got together and everybody prayed they, they were praying for soldiers and the war America was almost being taken over by the Japanese and the Germans and, and the security of the future wasn't there and people were fasting and praying and holding vigils and revival meetings and, and they were longing for God. But see, after we won the war and after things began to settle down, we began to get a bigger military, we began to get the UN, we began to depend upon one another and we thought everything was, everything was settled. America's too great to fall, right? Now, as soon as that attitude began to live in America, people uh, all of a sudden watch what's happening. In the same time periods, rock and roll was being born. Television is starting to come out. Sin is starting to go on the increase like never before. I, I thought it was amazing at the parallels when Brother Bram begins to talk about Belshazzar here who is, the, is actually the, the, the king at the time of the destruction of Babylon that his attitude, Brother Bram said his attitude, his spirit was that we cannot fall, we cannot be destroyed. Now here's the problem with that. The scripture had already been prophesied when Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream and Daniel had told Nebuchadnezzar that there would come an end to his kingdom and the Medes and the Persians were going to overtake it. When this scripture is being transpired in Daniel 5, there has been already two great battles between the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians. And the Babylonians had lost those battles and the Persians had besieged the city of Babylon. They was literally circled the city of Babylon and this 
this man was so arrogant that he didn't believe that they would be able to penetrate those walls or my kingdom cannot fall. Uh, uh, it's recorded in history that the day they threw this festival that, the, that they had looked out and the Persians had disappeared and they believed the Persians had gave up and went home. That's what they thought. They thought this is all over. Russia's not going to attack us. They're not going to use their bombs. This is all finished. We can all relax. We can hold a party. We can, we can, we can just go back to the business as usual. And Brother Ram says what happened that day was this, this Belshazzar, the Bible records it, that he invites a thousand of the princes and begins to have a party. And, and they, uh, I love how Brother Bram says things. He said they had a rock and roll party. Amen. They had a rock and roll party. Well, I'm the guy. I went back and looked. And you know, you do you realize that Elvis Presley did not even come into music until 1954. He come in Sun Records in 1954, amen, from, from down in the south of Mississippi there. And it's amazing to me that in 1954, what was transpiring on the earth spiritually, amen, but the entire American popular was swung towards rock and roll in the same hours that there was a prophet on the scene and God was doing something to deliver the people. And he was bringing the adoption authority to the church from the book of Romans, the Sun of God was going to receive the authority of the spoken word just in a short few years there would come a, an adoption robe set upon a bride, a blood washed bride and while God is transpiring, working in the supernatural to bring the greatest revival that has ever struck the planet in them same hours Satan is inspiring Elvis Presley to come out of the Pentecostal church and, and bring a rock and roll and drums and a hot guitar and cause the girls to begin to boogie woogie and brought, brought, actually brought sex acts right out on the platform and brought the spirit of sexuality and rock and roll and sensuality brought it right into the right into the platform. Back in 1954 amen, every church was preaching against it. The Baptists and the Lutherans and everybody was preaching against it but all of a sudden amen, the, the people, the people began to win the battle and begin to get what they wanted so rock and roll began to take over. Amen it had just a couple of years before that Prohibition had struck. It, it, it had never been like this in the history of the world. Alcohol was legalized right here in this country. Now, I come from Arkansas. I'll just be honest, for years, right there in that little town in Arkansas where we come from, you'd have to drive a solid hour to get a beer. You, you would, unless you found somebody illegal, because every county around where I live was dry. There was no, even till today, they're all dry counties. There, there was five liquor licenses give in a city I worked with in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and there was two clubs in that city, and, and there, there was five, I believe, five liquor licenses. We looked it up one day to see who owned it. Three of them, the Baptist Church owned. They bought them and used them and said, they, they actually bought the liquor license so nobody else could set up a beer joint in that town. That, that was the kind, of, that's the kind of feeling that was in that area against liquor. But, but you recognize if that would have stuck in every family, in every home. Now, we, now liquor's been legalized so long now that people don't think that much about it. Just a little social drink or a little, little something to be drank. But, but you recognize that it always magnifies the wrong kind of nature. Amen. And it emboldens. We used to say, uh, a guy get a little bit of whiskey in him, he's six foot tall and bulletproof. And that's true. Amen. They're six foot tall and bulletproof. They'll fight and meaner than a, a, a snake and, and, and make up bold things and do bold things. They never do that without alcohol. But the more alcohol they drink, the bolder people come, the more or less they're worried about the consequences of things. Amen. You, you, you see, when you're thinking with the right mind, you're thinking about the consequences of your choices, not just your choices. But when you, when you get a little bit under the wrong influence, you forget about the consequence and you just make the choice to whatever the, whatever the flesh wants. Now, we can promise you something, that the pleasure of sin, amen, it, it, the Bible calls it pleasure, so the pleasure of sin is real, but it is only for a season. 
You see, it is only a season that is pleasurable, and then it becomes very costly. There's many homes today that have been broken apart by alcohol. There's many homes today. There's many, there's many little kids that will go to bed tonight on an empty stomach with no clothes, amen, with, with, with a horrible living conditions because daddy went and spent the grocery money on, on a pack of beer and got drunk and, and spent it. I, I literally, oh my Lord, I don't know why I'm here, but can I, it's okay if I preach to you all this morning, amen, but literally I've seen guys give away $100 bills and their kids at home and they needing clothes and needing food and but they get a little drunk and they just lit, I, I've, I've literally heard of men holding hundred dollar bills and burning them right in the air because they's a little bit sodden they wanted to be uh, 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 show how big they were because they were on alcohol now 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 that that thing was alive in the days of Babylon and you you tell me where has it ever been any worse than it is right now you can't even go to a restaurant without there being alcohol everywhere. Amen. And what's going on? Why is it? Brother Bram tells us in the message, he says what happened is God sent a comforter. He says he cares, so he sends the word, which is a comforter. But men could not receive the spirit of truth as a comforter, so they're literally so neurotic they have to have something. So the alcohol is making more alcohol than they ever have. People drinking more whiskey, more beer, because they're trying to satisfy or bring a comfort to that situation that's in their life. They're smoking more cigarettes. Cigarettes were not even invented to the late 1800s or 1900s. Amen. If it wasn't back in the back in the 1700s, you don't have pictures or people walking around smoking cigarettes all day. That that wasn't that wasn't something to do. But it wasn't until the Marlboro Man come along, and then they went into the Hollywood and and Hollywood. See, it made a way to make it where uh, important people drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes. Amen. It made a way where people who were supposed to be a certain way did things like this which become popular which then become the uh, very run of the meal now I, I, th I hope you're seeing what I'm trying to say to you that the spirit that was in this day was no different than it was in that day. They were drinking. They were having a rock and roll party. They were enjoying the nightlife. They were having a good time. It wasn't just the people. The president was the one that invited them to do it. They're having a party because there's no consequence. There's no God. He can't see us. We're behind these walls. We're falsely secured. That's what a prophet is telling us. They were had their security in their military. They had their security in their walls, not in their God. Amen. But Brother Branham says it. He said, but look, he said, amen, God was not looking through the walls. He said he was looking down through, under, uh, through the walls. He was above the walls looking down on the sin. He wasn't trying to see it through. So the false security had brought them that way. Now, I, I want to take just a moment in this deceiving age we're living in. Brother, Brother Branham said it's the most deceiving of all the ages. This is the season of time when the man of sin shall be revealed. Now he said what was a, a child of disobedience in the days of Paul has now become a man of sin. He said how much greater is a man deceiving than a child is deceiving. So we're living in an age right now where we have built churches and church membership and people have become uh, members of churches and they have decided that they're secure in their church membership. Live like the devil five days a week, go to church on Sunday, but if you're a member of that church, it's all right, everything's okay, God's not going to be able to see through that church membership. Amen. Do you see the falseness of the security that is being built within the people, the lie that has been told to the people just believe and you've got the Holy Ghost just believe my doctrine and you're safe from all tribulation you're safe from everything just believe that's all you have to do is just believe and you got it it don't take a life it don't take doctrine it don't take truth it don't take life it don't take holiness hey, do, you, do you see the falseness of the security of what the devil done in that day he is repeated in this day doing the same thing but today men are not hiding behind walls they're hiding behind the fig leaf of man-made religion and they've decided that God can't see through it but he saw through it in the garden of Eden he looked right through Adam amen he looked right through Zacchaeus when he was hiding
hiding. He climbed up high and got behind a fig leaf. But that discerning spirit of the Lord Jesus looked right at him, amen, and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. You can't hide behind a leaf. Adam can't hide behind a leaf. And you can't hide behind a leaf. You cannot cover up sin. You cannot make it look pretty. You cannot say it's okay because, amen, because I'm so-and-so or I believe certain things. Sin, God will judge wherever that it is found. God will judge sin. That's the truth, friend. Amen, whether it don't matter where you come from or where you're going, that stands to be the truth. God will judge sin. And there is only one covering for sin. There is only one place to hide from sin. That is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the only way to get into Christ, he said, by one spirit we are baptized into one body. And the only way you can ever say, I am safe, is if you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will bring a safety into your life. Oh, aren't you so glad today to know that you're sitting under a word that has told you, don't be settled on memberships. Don't be settled with a church. Don't be settled with a doctrine. You get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and let the spirit of the life of Jesus Christ come upon you. Do you see what it is? It's a type of America. It's a false security. They close the doors and build up a military and believe they could do what they wanted to. Now look what they did. Brother Branham will say it in one place. He'll say, and while they were doing this, there was a prophet in the land. I thought, oh my. Daniel was there the whole time. There was a message and there was a prophet existing while they were going the way they were going. Amen. There was a prophet there the whole time. But rather than obeying the message, rather than humbling to the message, you know what they did? They made fun of it. Can you imagine making fun of a message with the Persians camped outside the gates? Uh, are you hearing me? Russia don't have to make bombs today. They got them. Putin doesn't have to describe and make new atomic warfare. He's got it. What will destroy this world is setting in the bomb hangers today. What is going to obliterate this world that we're in is in the bomb hangers. You say, well, God would never do that to America. But in 1933, the same guy that saw Germany being uh, Hitler invaded in, into, into Mussolini and how Mussolini would die and how the cigarettes would become illegal to smoke and how they would build the Maginot Line. Amen. How he said an automatic car was coming. How that there would be a woman dressed in purple of president or vice president of the country. Amen. The same guy that said all of that, he said the last thing I saw was America laying in ashes. He said I had to turn my head from it. It was so bad. Look, church, amen, this America is finished. This America judgment has come on it. Not, not today. In 1956, a prophet announced the judgment upon this nation. They had turned down the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and only judgment is left for this nation that we're living in. Do not build your home as an American. Do not build your life as an American. You are a citizen of a another kingdom. Do not invest in America. Do not invest in the politics of America. Do not set your securities as an American. Amen. Before I'm an American, I'm a son of God. Before I, amen, of any civilization of this earth, I am a child of God. Daniel was in Babylon, but he was not a Babylonian. He was an Israelite. Amen. And today we are the sons of God. And, and as the prophet said, we are more Jew than the Jew because we are spiritual Jew. By the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we are the seed of Abraham and heir according to the promise. The judgment that's on this nation, amen, does not mean our end. It is declaring our beginning. My, don't forget who you are. Now, what's amazing is they bring these things out and they begin to make fun of them. In one place, Brother Branham said the vessels they were making fun of was Holy Ghost filled people, God's vessels. They were making fun of the vessels. Uh, I, I, I think that it's a, amazing that the scriptures tells us that the arrogance of this man, I want you to read the chapter when you get home. I'm not going to read to you a lot. But, but the arrogance of this man, Belshazzar, this is how arrogant he was. 
in the middle of the very ones that were prophesied to take over his kingdom, he literally was having a rock and roll party. And to top it off, you know what he done? He told his, his, his people, his authorities, he said, you go down there and get the vessels that we pillaged out of Jerusalem where we destroyed that place of worship. You go get the vessels and bring them up here and let's drink out of them. Brother Bram said, can you imagine the vessel of God when they poured Pat's blue ribbon into the vessel? Can you imagine that? He had such a, a boldness that God could not get to him. He, meant he had such a disdaining thing for God that he poured that, that, that full of liquor and the, the thing that was concentrated, designed for the worship of Almighty God was being used for the worship of another God. Now, I don't have a message that says this so you can take it or leave it, but they say that Belshazzar had switched the, from the gods of Nebuchadnezzar and was worshiping a moon god whose name was Sin. I thought that was pretty fitting. Amen. It was a moon god and they were worshiping and they believed that the powers of the gods that they were under were greater than the gods of Daniel who had prophesied. Do you see what he's doing? He's facing the end and mocking the one that prophesied he would be ended. He was in the middle of it saying, "You, there's no end coming. There's no judgment coming. Hey Amen. Somebody go get the vessels out of that false god's temple that we took over and crushed. Go get them and let's drink. And they were drinking from the cups. Now, do y'all, do y'all, if you study the book of Jeremiah, you'll find this very, very interesting for the book of Jeremiah. You'll find out that while they were actually drinking from these cups, this is exactly when that a handwriting appears on the wall. When you look in Jeremiah chapter 50, you're reading chapter verses 28 to 34, the Bible actually says, amen, that them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare and design the vengeance of the Lord our God for the vengeance of his temple. Do you know in Jeremiah, this is nearly 80 years or 90 before they drink out of these cups and the, and the temple is being judged that God says through Jeremiah that when judgment comes to Babylon, it'll be for the vengeance of the temple of the Lord. And there he sits with a cup in his hand and he's drinking from this. Now, I, I don't have ability to set the scene, but I want you to realize it's a modern America and in the middle of modern America, in the middle of a rock and roll party, supernatural sign shows up on the wall and it says, many, many tickle you farson. Hey Amen. It's just a, the Bible says, I, I think it's amazing. I, I, was trying to, uh, I was trying to picture this yesterday. I was just trying to think what that king was thinking. When the Bible said he actually saw a part of the hand as it wrote it on the wall. Whew. Can you imagine? That God of Daniel can't get to me. Who? Who let him in here? Which one of you guards let him in here? How did that hand get on that wall to even write it? Because God's not subject to their rules or their orders. He was involved whether they weren't even involved or not. And he wrote, he wrote right on the wall a supernatural. Now, Brother Random, when he said when this supernatural comes, he said the supernatural, he said that's exactly how the Babylonian kingdom went out, the Gentile kingdom come in with supernatural on the wall, he said, and that's how the Gentile kingdom's going to end. The Gentile kingdom was the, was the time that Daniel was living there. It began, and it began with supernatural. But the middle of that supernatural was the ending of Babylon, and that's exactly how the Gentile kingdoms will end is with the supernatural. Can, can you think about this? In the middle of Elvis Presley having a rock and roll concert, amen, in Louisiana, across the street from the Louisiana Hayride 
was Jack Moore's Life Tabernacle where William Branham the seventh star was being introduced to America through Jack Moore's meetings and across the street was a Louisiana hayride. Elvis Presley was introducing the world to rock and roll. They were both having a gathering, one under rock and roll, one under the word of God. In the middle of the rock and roll party, the supernatural was being written on the wall. I've literally been down the street. Jack Moore's is on one side, Louisiana hayrides on the other side. There's two stars being born. Hollywood had a star, but God had a star. And one was going to lead us away from judgment, and the other was leading thousands into judgment. Amen, Elvis Presley. Amen. But you know what Brother Ram said about him? He said he was a Judas Iscariot. He said he had no business singing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. He said he's a hypocrite. He was a Judas Iscariot. And he led a million souls. Can you think about all the little girls tonight that is in hell because of that rock and roll boogie woogie music? Listen, let me. I, 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 oh God, I don't know what's wrong with me, Brother Ray, but I, I tell you, it's just the truth. But the Brother Ram said if you're unconverted, he said that rock and roll will sound pretty good to you. He said, you can't help it. These young people can't help it. It sounds pretty good to them. But I think the church of the living God ought to be grown up a little bit past rock and roll. I think it ought to be a shame if rock and roll is coming over our televisions and radios and whatever more in our homes and our little kids are hearing rock and roll because mom and daddy's doing it. Well, I'm preaching. I might as well go ahead and preach. And if anybody come to become the church tonight, I'd appreciate an amen. Amen. Do you see what it is? There's a rock and roll. And now I know... We were laughing about the other day, me and my daughter Beth Gracie was talking about it. She said, Dad, I, I understand country's bad. He said, she said, when they play it, people lose their dogs and they lose their homes and they lose their truck and they lose their parents and they lose their wife and they lose everything. <laughs> he, she said, but you know, when people play rock and roll, they kill their mom and they kill their dad and they burn their house. I mean, it's just a, it's just a greater advancement of the same thing. Now, now I, I don't have time to argue rock and roll. If you want to have that argument, we'll have it later, but I can promise you I'm going to win if we take the word. If we take the word, if we take modern arguments, you can reason your way out of anything. That's exactly what Eve did in the garden, and look at the mess she ended up in. So it's a good time to quit reasoning what, what a prophet said and believe what a prophet said. And if he said the thing will lead your soul to hell, it'll take you to hell in a handbasket. So it's time to get rid of it. Oh, church of the living God, it's time to have a house cleaning in the church of God. It's time to remember we are not just vessels. We are sanctified vessels of almighty God well my goodness amen do you see what it was it was a it was a it was a time of rock and roll it was a time when these things were happening they were drinking wine and they were rock and rolling and brother Bram said the modern strip teasers was dancing I wish you was preaching, Brother Ray. <laughs> you see what it was? You see the setting? You see what he's telling us? The idea, well, we'll just go dance a little and have a little drink. And Brother Bram is telling you that's exactly the state Babylon was in the day they got judged. Do you see what it was? God had gave them a message and the end is here. God had gave them a prophet. The end is here. But they made fun of it. The way people do today when you preach against rock and roll music. The same way they do today. Sitting right in churches and they'll just kind of snicker in the back of their mind. That old crank. That old, that old crank. If he was a young guy, he'd enjoy it. Well, I was a young guy and I preached against it when I was 21 years old. Probably a little harder than I am this morning. <laughs> I've seasoned a little bit. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> but they, they made fun of it. Do you, do you see that? They made fun of it. They made fun of what a prophet had to say about drinking and carousing and dancing and rock and roll. They literally were looking at the destruction and the end of the world laughing at a prophet. He said, Brother Wayne, I'm not laughing at a prophet, but the Bible says, Jesus says, your mouth is near me, 
but your heart is far from me. Do you see what happens is there has to be, there has to be a realization of the modern America and what we're looking at. There, there is a reason they're doing it, but it's not scriptural. See, when this, when this come on the wall, the supernatural appears in this kind of a moment, I just, it, just, it just struck me. It's happening at the same time. And, and now, the Bible says when the supernatural comes that the king is shaken by it. He, 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 he's, just, he's just, it's amazing to him that God would do something so supernatural because what it does, it brought a reality that there was a God. That maybe what Daniel said wasn't crazy. Maybe some of these things are true. So when this appears on the wall, he goes and gets all of his preachers and all of his soothsayers and he says to them, what does these things actually mean? What does these mean? Now, I, I thought it was amazing that none of them understood what it really meant. Nobody could tell him what that meant, what that writing was there. They didn't understand the language. They didn't know the handwriting. They was not familiar with this words of the, of the one they were dealing with. So they asked everybody. Nobody knew. Nobody knew how to take care of it. But Brother Bram says, but watch. The scripture says there was a woman who was a queen who lived in that day, which was the mother of Belshazzar, and they brought her in. Brother Bram said, notice she wasn't in the party. Hey she, hey, she wasn't in the party. She remembered from the days of Daniel. When they brought her in and she looked at the writing, she says, listen now, there is a man that's in the kingdom that was in the kingdom in the days of their father Nebuchadnezzar who, who would be able to solve problems like this. And he's here, and there's a man here that can dissolve the doubts. I think it's written in two places, in verse 10 and verse 12, that she said there's a man here that can dissolve doubts. When Brother Branham comes to this point, you would think that he would say he was the man that could dissolve the doubts. Brother Branham pushed that away. He said, see, there is a man in the kingdom he said, but the man in the kingdom is Jesus Christ. He said, there is a man in the kingdom today. See, he was standing in the Pentecostal kingdom and he was looking at the end of the Pentecostal age and he was saying to him, there's a man here right now in the kingdom who can dissolve the doubts. He can answer the questions. He can tell you what the supernatural is about. What does all these things mean? Man has no clue what they mean, but God is able to dissolve the doubts. Amen. Let me, let me just say this. I believe that Brother Branham was saying something very clear to us. Isaiah 66 says that there was darkness amen upon the earth and gross darkness on the people but at the same time the Bible said unto the children of God arise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee in the same hour of darkness when the great light of understanding and reality in the same hour those were the same words but they meant something totally different to two types of people it took the one who could understand it to dissolve the doubts of what the real meaning of it is. What is the real meaning of the message? What is the real meaning? I, I think it's powerful. What's the meaning of all the angels that were seen appearing through the 1940s and 1950s? Listen, I, I, I know some of you sitting here maybe don't realize this, but the angels were appearing to a lot more than Brother Branham. It meant not, my, not in ministry-wise, but angels were coming to people all over the country. I, I, right, right within my family, my grandmother had an angel come stand at the end of her bed two or three nights in a row at uh, different periods of her life. It was an angel would literally come in and stand, amen, just right in front of things. My dad, amen, had these experiences as a little boy back in the early 50s when he, he'd be in a rocking chair. He said he'd wake up and there'd be somebody sitting there in a rocking chair watching him sleep. Amen. He, he couldn't hardly sleep as a little boy. People all over the country, why was all these ministries springing up? Why was with the miracle? Men who wasn't even good men were seeing great miracles in their lives and revivals fires were striking. Amen. UFOs were being spotted everywhere. People used to make fun of the UFOs. Air Force is now releasing videos and proof that Air Force has been seeing UFOs for years. UFO, unidentified flying objects. Amen. Amen. What do they mean? What do they mean? Well, it took a prophet. 
Amen. But the prophet stood there and said, there's a man that can tell us what it is. It is the same thing in Genesis, the sixth chapter, when the two angels went down to Sodom. Brother Ben said there was an investigating judgment going on at that time. And God was sending watchers out of heaven to investigate what was going on on the earth. Look, church, they're not unidentified fine objects. They're angels who are there to look at the earth and see the condition it's in. For the Bible said, amen, when the cup of the Amorite of the iniquity has become full, that there would be a deliverance for the seed of Abraham. And God has got angels watching those cups because there's a deliverance that is coming on the church of the living God. Just like those angels were watching that night in Babylon, Daniel was a prisoner. Hebrew children were a prisoner. Thousands of Israelites were prisoners in Babylon. And while they were reveling in their party, God sent a supernatural sign on the wall. It meant judgment to one, but it meant deliverance to another. My, when I think about it this morning, I think about the grace of God when that appears. That queen said there is a dissolver of doubts. There's one that can dissolve your doubts. Brother Brown said, if you're having doubts about this message, he said, come up to the altar and ask the Holy Spirit about it. He'll dissolve your doubts. If there's a spirit of doubt, I preached a youth meeting one year in Edmonton and titled it The Dissolver of Doubts. I didn't realize it, but right then there was a there was a big critic that rose up in that area against the message, and one of their youth leaders had fell under it and become a Judas and was trying to pull the young people out of the church, pull them away from the message of the hour. And God sent me in there right at that time. And I preached a message, the dissolver of doubts. I didn't understand why I was preaching it at that moment, but I knew I was supposed to be preaching it. And while I was preaching that dissolver of doubts, I began to invite the children. Won't you just come and have an experience with somebody who can tell you if it's right don't ask me if it's right don't ask a, a preacher if it's right don't ask another man if it's right there's one that knows this message is right and it's the God that sent it and if you'll get in the presence of the angel of the Lord he will confirm to you this is the word in heaven but heaven they're not questioning in this message they're not questioning Brother Branham's teachings in heaven matter of fact Brother Branham went up there and they said Brother Branham we're resting on what you taught Heaven's resting on it. Amen. How much greater can we today put our rest and our hope and our strength in this message that we begin to believe? Let it search your heart. Let the message search your heart. Kill every doubt. Kill every feeling. Don't let that devil, amen, destroy you. I know there's a lot of gainsayers. There's a lot of critics. We were talking at the house the other day, and I told the kids, I said, I'll tell you this. Amen, I've studied a lot of uh, preachers. I've studied a lot of sermons. I've read a lot of uh, books. I've watched a lot of videos. I've seen Brother Branham's contemporaries. I've heard their tricks. I've seen their shanksters. I've seen all the nonsense they've done. Amen, but, but honestly, what did William Branham ever do but, uh, but exalt Jesus Christ? Honestly, from your heart, you, you answer that to me. What did Brother Branham ever do but exalt Jesus Christ? If you want to prove Jesus Christ is alive right now, you take any other ministry and prove it for me. But if you will allow me to use this message, I will give you physical evidence that Jesus Christ is not in a tomb over there in Israel. He is alive, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the almighty God. We're not here talking about a man named William Branham. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has rose up from the dead and is here in power and authority and glory. You talk about safety. I'm not building a bomb shelter. I'm not setting up A.A. A. Allen or no Alcoholics Anonymous either. Amen, that there is some feathers. <laughs> oh, God, there's some feathers. Amen, brother. Brother, in Psalms 91, he said we could hide. <laughs> Amen, we could hide. God will hide you under the feathers and the shadow of the Almighty. I believe there's a secret place, don't you? Come on, I can't, I can't pull off the fact that judgment struck it. William Branham said it did. Amen. In 1965, he threw up a rock. He said, judgment has struck the West Coast. And earthquakes, earthquakes begin to release on that West Coast that ain't stopped yet. They ain't stopped yet. It almost sunk Alaska, but there's vibrations running in the earth. 
amen, that one of those vibrations, one of these days will hit the right moment. And when the angels look upon the earth and said, that's the finish of it, we're done with it, L.A.'s going to sink, friends. It's going to go under the ocean. And right there in that place of judgment, they're producing movies, and they're producing filth, and they're producing everything. Amen. But what is it? God has already predicted what would happen, in it? But when judgment began to fall, amen, there was something that was given to the church that she would be able to be delivered. This writing was written was many, many tickle you farson. And Daniel himself, when he comes into the room to interpret it, I thought it was pretty amazing because Daniel don't just go in there and interpret it. He gives that king a rebuke. Go read it. Serious. A serious rebuke. He tells him that this kingdom is falling because of the same sin Nebuchadnezzar had committed and had been seven years in the wilderness for it. And he's told him, he said, look at this. He said to him, he said, look, king, you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You know what happened. You, that was your granddaddy. You know what happened to him when he revolted against God. You know what happened to that man. But yet you do this anyhow? You, you, you act like this knowing you know what happened then and you acting like it ain't going to happen now? Come on, church. Come on now. That adulterous spirit ruined other men. It'll ruin you. That alcohol ruined others. It'll ruin you. Tobacco ruined others. It'll ruin you. You know what it does. Amen. I think it's high time that we quit being arrogant and start repenting and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I thought that way or felt that way. Because what it really meant, many, many tickle you farce, and what it really meant, to put it in simple language, it meant you in trouble. <laughs> you in real trouble. You in the kind of big trouble you can't get out of trouble. You in trouble. This prophet looks at him and says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Meaning, meaning God hath numbered thy kingdom. It's finished. Whew. It's finished. You think about that. When God says it's finished, it's finished. He said it's finished. When God pronounces something as finished, it's finished. It's fulfilled its time. It's amazing when you read Revelation, the 10th chapter, isn't it? When a mighty angel comes down out of heaven, he has his hands lifted. And his announcement is, time will be no more. What's this message mean anyhow? It's finished. According to Daniel 12, the book is open at the end time. According to scripture, the seventh angel is the last angel to the, to the church ages. It means it's finished. Brother Bram said the seventh seal means the end. The end of struggling nature. The end. What, what's it the end of, Brother Wayne? I tell you, in, in the church age book, can I, can I have some liberty here on church age book? In the church age book, he thinks, well, you done took a bunch of liberty, Brother Wayne. <laughs> uh, in, in the church age book, Brother Branham actually says this. And I, I, sometimes I, I just want to put in a little plug for Brother Branham because I get so tired of people uh, 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 attacking the, 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 the grace of God that was sent through him. But Brother Branham will say in the church age book, he said, I predict and do not prophesy that the world systems will end in 1977. He said, I say this by divine inspiration. So people went around, and Brother Bram says, I predict, I do not prophesy. Do not go say, Brother Bram said. But they did. They went and said, and he didn't say. So it made it appear Brother Bram had falsely said. He said, well, he said it by divine inspiration. He did. He had divine inspired dreams, seven of them, or visions. And he said, according to those, I don't see how it could go past. You said, Brother Wayne, did something end? It did. World systems did end. If you're reading the church age book, world systems are denominational ages. According to the breach, 
Amen. It used to be page 74. I don't know what the page is now. But according to Breach, page 74, Brother Bram said, when the book is open, denominational ages are ended. He said, what God is doing now is revealing what they left out. You said, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying it's finished. I'm saying church government is finished. I'm saying the shuck carried the lie for a period, but it's finished. The seed and the shuck have now separated. Judgment is fell upon the shuck. Amen. It's being gathered in the garner for the burning. Amen. The harvesting angels have come upon the earth and they're gathering the church of the living God and denomination is bundling the rest of it together. It's finished. <laughs> and we could preach a while on that. It's, it's finished. Amen. What is it? It's finished. And the interpretation means thou art weighed in a balance and found wanting. In other words, God's word on one side and you on the other side and you don't weigh enough. Be the first time we were told we didn't weigh enough, huh? You can't meet the balance. But if you see what's on the other side, you'll understand why you can't meet the balance. Because people say, well, Brother Wayne, I'm a good man. I do good works. I go to church. I do this. I do this. I do this. And they give you all these works, and you put all them works on one side, and you put Jesus on the other side, and you still don't weigh enough. Because you're never going to weigh enough on those scales. You know what those scales say? Be ye perfect, even as my Father in heaven, which is perfect. Only perfection will weigh out on those scales. And Brother Bram said, how are you going to be a perfect people, be married to a perfect bridegroom, and live in a perfect place, except for the perfect word. So he's telling you the only way to weigh on these scales of judgment is this message is going to have to come into you. This perfect word is going to have to live not as a doctrine but as a life. It's got to come into the church because the church, the world has been found wanting. Amen. And it doesn't weigh enough. And thy kingdom is then divided and given unto the Medes and the Persians. Right then, right at that very hour, there was something going on. Babylon had been built into the standard of like the Garden of Eden. And it was a city where the palace was in the center and a river run underneath those 200 foot high walls. There was a river run under those 80 foot thick walls and it was an exceptionally dry season that year. And the Persians, while they had besieged, had secretly been out there digging a detour for that river to empty the channel that they could go under that wall. So when, when he looked out, when Belshazzar looked out and said, well, they're all gone. They've left the city. They've run because of the great and mighty Babylon. That wasn't what had happened. They had went down into the riverbeds and they couldn't be seen. And that night he went through a party to rejoice that they're all gone. And while he was partying, a supernatural sign said judgment has come. Daniel had said your kingdom is leaving you. In that same hour, Persia come under them 80 foot thick walls and came straight to the palace. The Bible records that this man was killed that very night. He meant it wasn't a long time coming. He was killed that very night. But you know something that was powerful about this story? The moment the Babylonian kingdom was killed, he meant it changed kingdoms. Same city, same, same setup, same building, same people everywhere, but the kingdom had changed. The authority had changed. The dispensations had changed. There had come an end to one and the beginning of another. Do you know what had happened? Darius had been made king who was a Mede. And he had a buddy who he was partners with was a Persian who was named was Cyrus. Let me ever read about King Cyrus. King Cyrus had been predicted in Isaiah. It was 600 years or 400 years before the fall of Babylon that, that Isaiah prophesied that there would be, Isaiah 45 exactly, there would be a man whose name was Sirius who would come into the kingdom of Babylon and who would take over the gates of that kingdom and would deliver the children of God. Can you imagine that God could predict a deliverer who was a Gentile who didn't even know God and say, I'm going to send him in there and he's going to deliver you and not only will he deliver you, he'll rebuild your temple. He'll give you your liberty. He'll help you get back to your land. Your your exile days are over. He said, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying when the supernatural appeared on the wall, to one kingdom, it was a finish. To one kingdom, it was an end. 
It was the destruction. It was the end of their system. But to the other kingdom, it was the dawning of a new day. The opening of the seven seals was not the end of the bride. It was the beginning of a bright age. It was the beginning of a dispensation where the word of God was going to rule over the church of God. Amen. We are not going into darkness, but we have come out of dark Laodicea, and we have moved into the rising of the sun. There has been another government issued upon the church of the living God. I think about it this morning, and I think about the ends of systems. I think about the end of denomination. I think about the end of the shock. I think about the end of it. It happened down there with Moses in the Bible when he went into Goshen. Amen. What was it? His coming, his supernatural was the end to Pharaoh. But it wasn't the end to the children of Israel. It was the dawning of a new day. The promise had come unto them. The deliverer had come to their house. I believe this morning, church, amen, that this message of judgment is not a judgment upon the bride. It's a judgment upon the world. I believe the supernatural means the world has come under judgment, but the church of the living God has moved into a rapture cycle where the anointing of God is upon their life. We are at the place. <laughs> We're at the place Israel was when they returned back to their homeland, when they went back to rebuild their temple, when they went back to go back to the order of their worship. You know what they'd done? Just to tell you, when they went into captivity, they had went by the willow trees, and they had hung up their harps, and they went into captivity. And them harps had been hanging there for 70 years. Amen. But now that the supernatural sign had come, they could turn around, and they could go back and pick them harps up on their way back home. Listen, I believe that the hour of worship has come to the bride of Christ. I, I believe the Bible said when the book was opened up, amen, the Bible said they heard me, John, shouting. They heard me on the earth and they heard me in the heavens and they heard me under the earth. What does the supernatural mean? It means a day of worship for the church of the living God. Not worshiping under a Pentecostal feast. Worshiping under, amen, the feast of tabernacles of the sons of the living God adoption time, rapture time Holy Ghost time what does it all mean? Look up there. Amen. A cloud appears in the sky. 1963. Luke magazine picks it up. Life magazine picks it up. What does it mean? What does it mean? Judgment. What does it mean? It means an end. Amen, but what does it mean to the bride? Brother Ben said it's our Lord up there. It means divine vindication. Supreme authority has returned to the church. We're not under the bondage of an idea of denomination this morning. We have been released in the power of the Holy Ghost. My Lord, what is happening is God has begun to tell us the meaning. The meaning of the supernatural. What is the meaning? The meaning is, it, and the meaning is Matthew 24, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles are gathered together. Amen. What's them eagles gathering on fresh manna? It means fresh food has come. It means grace has come. It means the power of salvation has come. Listen to me this morning, young people. This is not coming. You're in the middle of it. It's not on its way. You're in the hour of it. Brother Branham said this, and I, I thought I'd shout out of my bedroom this morning when I read this. He said, listen, he said, he said, Russia's got them bombs ready now. He said, they're setting ready now. What destroys the world is in the hands of sinful men. He said, before morning, he said, America could be in craters. He said, but let me assure you that the bride will be in glory before that. I said, oh, glory be to God. It means bombs are going to fall on Russia, but the bride will be setting in glory. Can, can I tell you what my heart is? That's not false hope. <laughs> That's not false security. That is the eagle anointing. We have received a message, church. We have built free. We have come out. We have set ourselves under the power and the authority of Almighty God. We're not here this morning under the bondage of man. We have the liberty of God upon our lives. Some of you have come through it. I know you have. Amen. Every, every little thing, every little situation, you have to approve through man. But let me see. We've come under another headship. 
We've come under an adoption age of the church. What does it mean? Where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. What does it mean? The day when the Son of Man shall be revealed, when Christ shall come into the church as the form of the bride of Jesus Christ. Can I say it to you this morning? Open up, O ye gates, and let the King of glory come into your heart. Let the power of God drop into your life. It's what it means. What it means is it's available. What it means, what the supernatural means is the days of waiting are over. Seal it up, John, till the seventh angel sounds. We've had the seventh angel now. Can I preach the thunders now? Can I preach the seals now? Can I preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost now? Can I preach predestination now? Amen. Listen, I know there's a whole bunch of places you can't do it, but we happen to be in a church that you can't preach it too hard. You can't preach it too simple. You can't preach it too deep because they're the bride church of Almighty God where the word has come to stimulate power and authority. Hey man, listen, I, I'm saying the wait is over. I'm saying it's finished. I'm saying revival has come. I'm saying that we're not looking for revival. I'm saying we are revival. I'm not saying we're looking for rapture. I'm saying we are rapture. We're not looking for a group of young people to raise up in power. There is a group on the earth. Whew. I tell you what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you ever wanted to shout, it's shouting time. If you ever wanted to rejoice, it's rejoicing time. I walked out of my house this morning and the devil hit me from every corner. You can't, you can't preach it like that and somebody might overreact and somebody's going to get upset and something's going to happen like that. By the time I got to my car, I said, shut up, devil. I ain't taking you to church with me. I let alone ain't taking you to the pulpit with me. Amen. If there is somebody in the house of God that wants to rejoice, I think it's time to kick the devil off your back and rejoice in the name of God. Lift up your heavy hands and remember what joy and liberty and freedom Freedom feels like. Remember the grace of God that's been put in your life. You remember when you used to feel the power come on you and you wanted to talk with other tongues. This is the age to do it. Just go ahead and let God do something in your life. So by the way, it's all finished. No, you telling me it's finished is finished. You can't act like that in the house of God. That's finished for me. You, you, you can't exercise the gifts of God. Listen, if it's God's gifts, why can't we? So there's, well, Brother Wayne, there's an order. And whoever did you see get out of order with it anyhow? You ain't seen nobody get out of order with it, but we welcome it. We welcome the return of the pillar of fire. We welcome, we throw the doors open. Let the pillar of fire swirl in this meeting. Let it deliver our young people. Let the power of God, we don't want to make fun of the moving of the Holy Ghost. We don't want to make fun of the power of God. That's finished. That's over. It's in another age. This is not just a bunch of Pentecostal bubble dancing. This is people who know who they are. They know where they they come from. They believe a doctrine of truth. They believe a message of the hour. Listen to me. If the Pentecostals can shout on a guitar and a drum, how much more should the church of the living God begin to rejoice over the opening of seven seals and the power of a redemptive book? The supernatural has struck the church with authority and power. It's time to say, devil, I'm finished with it. I remember when you used to shout before you got critical. I remember before the devil started talking to you. Amen. Got you all tied up looking over there at that guy, looking over at that girl. I remember when it was free on you. Amen. I think it ought to be free again. I think you ought to kick that devil to the curb this morning and say, I'm not going to spend another hour sitting in church with an old critical spirit on me. I'm going to throw that thing down this morning and rejoice in the power of God. I'm not out of the scripture. Brother Bam said it meant victory in the house of God. You say, I don't like that dancing. Well, get a little victory, and you'll feel so much better about it. <laughs> What's it mean, Brother Wayne? The devil is finished. It's what it means. The meaning of this writing, the devil's done. He's in trouble. 
But it means something else. It means the latter glory has begun. It means there's a latter glory coming in the church. Amen. What they had in the beginning and what they would have at the end would come together. And if that supernatural sign, the God that visited Israel to begin with was leading them back to worship as Israelites and the church for the first time in the history of the world. Amen. The book has come open. I, I, I don't know if I could, be, I don't have the, the language to say the importance of that. Brother, Brother Darrell, there's been millions of people on that book, but we're the first people who know our names on that book. We're not worshiping and shouting and rejoicing over a good feeling. Our, our rejoice is deeper than that. Our feeling is greater than that. We are looking at the Lamb's book of life and we can't be taken out of it. All the rock and roll parties will never get you. All the devils will never get you. You're sealed in with the token of the Holy Ghost. What is going on in latter glory is falling. A latter glory, the former and the latter shall fall together. It's a harvest rain. It's an anointed word that's coming upon the church. Rapturing faith. It's the latter glory. It's not just a bunch of a bunch of hoodoo coming in the in the. Uh, I want to ask sometime. Makes me want to ask somebody. If now, not if now, if not now, then you tell me when. If, if it's not now, you, 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 you get a mic and stand by me and tell me when it will happen. You tell me when there will never be, ever be people who are more committed to a message than there is right now. You tell me where you're going to find young people like we've got right now in history or in the future. I believe this is a season. I believe we're in the hour. I believe the power of God has dropped upon the church. Sirius was coming to deliver. There's a king here greater than Sirius this morning. The Bible said the Lord himself would descend from heaven. Christ has come as a deliverer to the church. If it's not now, when is it? If it's not now, when is it? Brother visited our, our, our youth camp over here. One of them left it. He said one of the church members looked over him and said, man, that's like a revival. He said, I've been trying to tell you we're in the bride's revival. I've been trying to tell you. If you're not shouting, it's not God's fault. If you're not in revival, it's not God's fault. If you're not enjoying the season you're living in, you, you, come on, you're like a person you took to a steak restaurant and they ordered french fries. If you're not enjoying it, it's not their fault. I've been, to, I've been to The Rock in Dayton with Brother David. It's a little bit of an expensive place to go. He looks at me and says, have whatever you want. Well, if I don't, whose fault is it? <laughs> Payment's there. Well, I'll be humble. Really? Is that really what he wanted? Does he want me to take the cheapest thing? Did he take me all the way over to that restaurant to buy me a steak to make sure I didn't get what I wanted? He took me there because he wanted me to have something and he wanted to give me something. Are you hearing me? God brought you here because he wants to give you something. God ain't, God ain't want you, amen, to say, well, I better not take that because it's just too much and I'm not worthy and it won't be. God's brought you to the bride's revival. The final push of the rapture is upon the church. It's a time and a season like none you've ever lived in. I'll tell you the hour for it, church. The supernatural's on the wall. The signs have been seen. Amen. The world is in rock and roll parties with its alcohol. But the church of the living God, they're feeling the power of the theophany of God pulling. What you've been looking for, what you've been praying for, Sister Thelma can witness it right here. She's been in this message for years. And she's standing there saying to you, you young people, look at her. She's an elder. She's been through movements. She was looking for the dynamics. She was searching for it. Here she's standing there saying, the dynamics is here. You're hearing a preacher say it. There's an elder say it. There's an elder say it. People who have lived in the days you're looking at says this day is greater than all the other days that you've ever lived. This is the hour to do it. This is the hour to say it. My, what a time to live 
What an hour to be in the grace of God. Amen. Brother Ben, would you come? What an hour. What a time. What a blessing. What does it mean according to who you are? It matters who you are at what it means. Some people only see doom and gloom. Well, if you're of the wrong race, that's all it means. But if you're of that bride seed, it means there is a deliverance descended upon the earth like none has ever been. A delivering power, an angel sent from heaven to break the chains and the confinements of Babylon. To release a people like but Jim, liberty. Chains are gone. Dispensations are broken. Whew. Free. By the way, you want me to shout like you do? No, I want you to be free. I want you to be free. I've heard people shout till the roof come off and not an ounce of power in the building. We're not looking for a shout. We're looking for the power of God that comes under its liberty of the anointing. And that's exactly what we're feeling in here this morning. Not just loud, there's a power in it. There's an anointing behind it. There's enough in here this morning to deliver, to set free, to give you mercy. You say, Brother Wayne, what do I got to do? I'll tell you what you need to do. You just need to drop all your reasoning, drop all your argument with the message, and just accept it as king. Accept it as king. And you'll be invited to his table. Can y'all stand with me this morning? <laughs> what a day. What an hour to live. The dispensation that we have been given. <laughs> There's no day like it. Friends, we're not going to rebuild a tabernacle. We're going to heaven. Our tabernacle's already been built. We got a mansion. So, Brother Wayne, when's that theophany? When's it? Well, I'm of one that believes. That's what's pulling on you now. I'm, I, I believe that's what's pulling at you right now. I believe when you heard the message and you said amen to it, Brother Bram said you heard. You heard from your theophany. Something urging you this morning. What an hour. Supernatural's on the wall, friends. If you got the right seed, it's, it's your deliverance. It's not your judgment. One day a lady from the church down in Arkansas, a good family of mine, she's had utmost respect and been a blessing to me for years and She'd hear me preach one time. She said, Brother Wayne, she said, I swear, when you got done preaching, I didn't think there could be one person in that building saved. She said, I thought everybody in the place must be lost. She said, the next time you preached, she said, it sounded like nobody could miss the rapture. She said, can you help me? I said, sure, it just matters who you are. It just matters who you are. It matters who you are this morning. It's what the supernatural, it means something different. What it means to this world is the end. What it means to you is liberty and life. Let's just bow our hearts. Maybe you're here today. The first portion of this message, maybe it spoke something to you. Maybe even as a child of Abraham, you got involved in the rock and roll party. You'd like to identify yourself today. So, Brother Wayne, I don't want to be counted by that number. I don't want to be in it. I don't, I don't desire that. I don't want to be a part of that. I want to surrender it. I want to repent from it. God bless you, son. God bless you, sis. God bless you. My hearts are real sincere right now. So if you... Take just a moment. Brother Bram said God's watching. 
He's seen you do it. Wouldn't you want him to see you repent for it? Lord, I'm sorry. I bless his hands. As our hearts are bowed, Father. Lord, it looks like the judgment. Lord, couldn't miss nobody. It'll be so thorough. Look like the whole world, Lord. But there was a little elect group prophesied in Matthew 25. That they'd escape it. In Revelation 4, you had John escape the Laodicean age with a word. Lift him. The Father today, escaping tribulation. Escaping it. Lord, they're escaping by the word. They're bypassing. They believe the word. They don't have to feel the judgment. The Father, as these hands has been lifted in this room, sincere hearts. Father, the world, the systems, the situations that's around us, is, it's an atmosphere. People get involved before they even realize they're in it. Satan is so slick. It wraps around lives like a creeper and pulls them in and tries to hold them. But Father, in this meeting this morning, something has struck their heart and they realize, Lord, that they've been wrong. They're making excuses for things that's wrong. They're letting wrong things happen in their life. Father, it's a heart this morning. Don't want to be identified with that. And Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for the moment, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to, to lift our hands and say, Lord, forgive us. Father, I, I lift my hands. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for anything, Lord, that we could ever fail you. We ask you for your mercy on our lives, Lord. So we ask you this morning as we pray that may your spirit, Lord, may you deal with every individual. And Lord, may it not just be a repentance, but Father, if somebody needs the Holy Ghost, may they flee to you, Lord. May they, may they see it's the season. This is the time. I've heard so many say, well, someday when it's right. But Lord, I know it's the season. This is the hour that the, the white horse is riding, Lord. The, the ink rider is riding and he's marking. And I pray, Father, that he'd mark every soul in this building. May the, may the Holy Ghost put its brand upon our lives, Lord. When that great death angel begins to move, they'd hear a voice say, not that one. They belong to me. Oh, God. I thank you for it this morning now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You got something? Falling in love with Jesus Falling in love with Jesus Falling in love with Jesus Is the best thing I've been Time.
Best thing I've ever 